you had books and then you had ebooks. You had mail and then you had email. You had gold and now you have e gold. people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community and blockchain ways across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Benjamin Minko, the founder and CEO of Elrond, one of the most interesting and exciting projects of 2020. Benjamin, such a pleasure to have you. How are you doing today? Great. Really great to be here, Alex, and have this conversation. Congratulations on all your success this year so far. Benjamin, you guys have been doing tremendous work. But before jumping into Elrond, I'd love to ask you, what inspired you, Benjamin? Was it a person? Was it Bitcoin? Was it a blockchain? Why did you end up, you know, coming into this crazy space? <laughs> Indeed, it was, I believe, 2012 when I initially stumbled into Bitcoin. But then in 2013, um, it, it really was extremely intriguing to me how technology was um, combined in a way uh, where economics was also there. So this currency um, drew a lot of attention. Um, it, it grew a lot, much like the early days of the internet when the internet grew um, at a very, very significant speed. And I began researching what was happening there. Um, I, I was specifically at that point researching technologies that I thought were um, uh, capable of changing the the dynamics of our economy and of the entire society and so bitcoin was this really intriguing idea that looked like a almost like a joke um, a, a game and uh, it when when you understood its economics um, it was clear that it could reshape the economy so at that point i wanted to to dig in a lot more and see what was happening in the space. And then um, immediately afterwards, in probably six months, um, in at the beginning of 2014, I essentially joined the NEM core team to um, try to solve some of the um, uh, issues that I saw in Bitcoin even at that point. So it was a very, very interesting um, start. And since that point, I've been indeed involved in several different aspects of the blockchain space. So I, I've been building um, on the one hand, different startups and helping um, invest in um, more than 20 or 30 startups in the space. And then um, since the end of 2017, uh, my whole focus was basically on Elrond where um, we've built this really hardcore team with which we can literally build rockets and then focus on, on uh, building the technology and bringing it to the market. So yeah, a, a long story there, but um, I believe that uh, without that backstory, uh, we would not have been um, here today. That's fantastic, man. I mean, and it's, uh, it's typical from most engineers to always want to solve problems, right? To get into things because they find it very interesting and want to solve problems. And we'll talk about the problems that you guys are solving. But before we jump into that, I'd love to ask you about this whole internet or web 3.0. You know, what exactly does that mean? If you don't mind educating us going from web 1.0, which some people call a database all the way to web 3.0, which some people call a data bank. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what is but, it yeah. in your terms, this whole Internet of Scale and this Web 3.0 concept? 
Um, I think very briefly, Internet uh, 1.0 was this idea that you had a first network of networks through which you could share some information um, in the sense of uh, very um, low bandwidth, um, low speed. And with this, you could still see what you could build on the Internet, but it was still very, very rudimentary. The second wave uh, or Web 2 was much more social. You had um, high bandwidth already um, and then um, you economics started to make sense. But um, then everything shifted toward the social aspect. And now we're at the point where um, for the first time we have an automatic protocol that fits and can be embedded in the core of the Internet to enable transfer of value. So why, while I believe that we've um, been able to transfer data, very rudimentary forms of data from the beginning um, and, and then increase the speed and possibilities and move to social with the Web2, um, everything in Web3 is first about finance and what it means to um, basically encode finance um, in the base layer of the internet. And then, of course, to extend this uh, to um, trustless exchange of any kind of um, value that we can um, now exchange over the internet. Very nicely put. I love it, Benjamin. Thank you so much for such a great answer. And obviously, you so you talked about this evolution and there's Ethereum as well, right, who, who claim themselves or want to build this Web 3.0. But as you know, there have been many issues recently, congested networks, really high gas fees. Uh, and a lot of people are interested in hearing what is uh, a comparison between Ethereum and Elrond. If you don't mind sharing that, that would be great. Yeah, I would say that Ethereum has been trying to build um, state charting and proof of stake for uh, at least four or five years now. Uh, they've been uh, typically always two years away. So um, uh, no matter how much uh, progress they made or how little progress they made, um, they, they always um, said that it's two years away. Uh, for Elrond, we've been working on a very key part of technology that we believe can finally transition everything we have in the blockchain space to an, uh, a broadband era so that you can process transactions of any kind and exchange value at the internet scale, which means that you finally have broadband speed, really, really low cost and can build anything you want just because the, the architecture um, allows you to do this. We've been working on this uh, since almost three years now, but the most important thing about Elrond is that the technology is live. Um, compared to all the other projects that might promise different things but never deliver, uh, we've made a really, really um, huge step forward with the mainnet that we've released on the 30th of July. Our entire team has poured their souls into this and now with the technology live, uh, we are also building a user interface that intends to simplify the whole experience around this. Now, coming back to Ethereum and the comparison between Elrond and Ethereum, um, there are several aspects there. First, I would say that Ethereum will have some very, very important difficulties of changing their um, uh, the, the way they work just because they already have an architecture that has fairly large adoption in the um, small space that we have and changing a technology while it's working is very similar to driving a car um, and then trying to change the engine while you keep driving around and, and so forth. It's super, super difficult from an engineering perspective and um, given that they have some incentives for miners and so forth to not move to the new model that would eliminate um, millions of dollars that the miners have invested in that, there are also some conflicts of interests there. Uh, but going beyond this, everything that Ethereum intends to do with Ethereum 2.0, Elrond already has working, uh, which is which is, I, I think, um, extremely important. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure who will wait another two years 
um, for for Ethereum to ship. But the differences in technology are um, also interesting because the key point for Elrond is we have what is called adaptive state sharding. And the accent is on adaptive because it means that Elrond can start with two shards um, and process uh, more than 10,000 transactions per second. But the number of shards can increase with the demand that we really have in the network, which means that we are not only scalable um, and adaptive, but also very resource efficient. It means that we don't have to start with 100 shards if there is no demand for 100 shards. And I think this is the largest of the differences. Ethereum also tries to do um, state sharding. They try to do um, proof of stake. But the, the um, point of the matter is that at this point, they only have something um, very, very rudimentary with which they're playing. And um, given what we've been through with our architecture, they're still um, years away of um, coming to production with, with that part. So that, that meaning of adaptive state sharding, like how would you explain this in layman terms? Like if my grandma Susie was watching the show, Benjamin, how would you explain what adaptive state sharding is at Elrond? Sure. Uh, so very briefly, sharding, this idea of sharding exists already in databases it means that you have this process of dividing and conquering and then parallelizing things. So instead of processing them in a serial um, sequence, you have this parallel processing unit, which allows you to, to move a lot faster. Um, and then adaptivity on top of that means that uh, you only need to add number of shards um, proportional to the demand you have in the network. Uh, for each shard, we gain um, something like 5,000 transactions per second. So we estimated that with 10,000 transactions per second, we are already 1,000 times um, more efficient than Bitcoin or Ethereum, which is a lot more than is needed at this point. Uh, it might, uh, the demand might be there um, and might uh, we might need to update this in a few months. But at this point, um, this is something extremely, extremely important from a processing uh, capacity. So we are excited to have this in, in Elrond. Very nicely explained. Thank you so much for that, Benjamin. And uh, the next question would be related to virtual machines. First of all, if you could explain virtual machines in a simple term. And is the Elrond and Ethereum virtual machines similar or are a little bit different at the moment? The idea of blockchain can be seen in, in a few different ways, but essentially um, compared to normal databases, blockchains are databases that are operated in a distributed fashion. So while Amazon has a database that they can um, um, uh, essentially share with everyone, but they're the owner, blockchains are this larger databases that uh, are operated by a lot of different third parties in a um, um, self-interested way where the incentives of the network allow people to organize and there's no trusted party that controls the entire network. Now, moving uh, one step further, once you understand that even the, the most advanced blockchains have uh, this kind of um, network property, of being very similar to um, a, a database, there are some interesting properties that a blockchain has, which is transparency, immutability, and um, um, uh, censorship resistance, and so forth. But then on top of this, you have a way of programming different aspects within this blockchain. And this programming layer is called the virtual machine. So it essentially allows you to execute some um, super simple programs just as you would on, on a computer. But uh, you have to assume that um, still with the earliest versions of um, the virtual machine from Ethereum, um, you still have some bandwidth limitation. Again, just because the underlying database um, has um, the limitations, the virtual machine will inherit the limitations as well. So in Elrond, 
what we are doing uh, specifically is we have this super high performance architecture and then um, the virtual machine is again um, inheriting some of the performance that the architecture has so things become a lot more interesting um, as for differences we have um, instead of going with the ethereum virtual machine the elrond virtual machine is built on top of wasm so this means that people um, in the blockchain space with background or from outside of the blockchain space with background in in um, programming languages such as c c plus plus or rust can build smart contracts on Elrond a lot easier uh, than they would on Ethereum. And it also means that further down the road, we will um, enable them to build smart contracts in even more languages and make things even more simple for them. Very nicely put, Ben. I mean, so is it fair to say that, for example, if a smart contract is a document with information, that a virtual machine is kind of like a cyber agent, the person who's passing it on, within that network is that a simple way or <laughs> accurate way yes it's like a, a indeed a, a processing machine but the idea is that the virtual machine does not only um pass the information um here and there but also can code a way in which the information is passed so you can both say please bring this information to uh, from a to b but then also say uh, let's do it such that we only bring the information from A to B when I received this type of money from A and when B has um, some particular criteria uh, that we want to be met. Oh, so that virtual machine can actually optimize the transaction as well, not just pass it on to another agent. Exactly. De define a, an algorithm for um, how the transaction should be executed. Like uh, you, you can build an escrow, you can build several different criteria that have to be met. And only at that point, the transaction is triggered. Um, and it, it essentially allows you to build a much richer ecosystem already because um, you also can go one step backward and say, if you look at Bitcoin, there is no virtual machine. There is no programmability. So uh, things can be a lot worse than they are right now, uh, With especially if you look at Bitcoin. Then uh, if you look at what we have right now, there's clearly room for improvement. And um, this is uh, what we're trying to do with Elrond. You know, that's really cool that you're doing your best to accommodate a platform and an interface that is easy for engineers, right? Not having to learn a new language and use the languages that most people are familiar with. And that, that's a perfect segue to Myar, right? The new user interface that you guys have built. Can you tell us a little bit more and, and why you're doing this? Is this mainly for getting more and more engineers to contribute to your ecosystem? Sure. The, the whole point of Elrond is essentially that we're trying to build this global, transparent, non-inflationary financial system. And this is uh, what we're trying to do with Elrond Network. This is the basis for Elrond Network. And um, second, what we are trying to do is give anyone anywhere easy access to this uh, new financial system. The only way we can do this is by first building this um, high bandwidth, low latency, high security, low cost network um, that is already running with Elrond. But then what we've discovered is that we need to come up with a breakthrough that is equally powerful in terms of user experience so that all the uh, key features that we have in the blockchain that we've built, we want to um, take them and put them in a interface that is extremely simple that abstracts away the entire complexity and if you have a username called a hero tag you'll essentially be able to send money to anyone it's super easy and of course you'll be able to stake you'll be able to lend um, and um, we'll have several other applications that we can build only because we have both the blockchain and this very simple um, user interface. But the key point with Myar is if we think that we really want to bring blockchain to uh, the next billion people, 
and escape this narrow group of people that we are um, uh, just um, exchanging money with currently in the blockchain space, then it's super necessary to forget everything we know in terms of complexity and um, forget all these things that we've um, um, got used to um, and simplify things so that our grandmothers and our, our parents can interact with them without even knowing what's underneath. Because if you look right now at how um, email works, nobody really knows that uh, you're using the SMTP protocol. What they know is email is super useful. It's much more useful compared to the normal mailing system. So this is what they're um, they're going to discover through Myar that essentially everything they've um, got used to transferring money via banks or other means, they can finally do it um, a lot faster. So near instantly, anywhere in the world at and um, at 100x lower cost than um, any other alternative. So we are super, super um, excited about this. That's the nice transition to the ERD coin and token. You guys also launched your mainnet. Congratulations for achieving that. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are really excited about what's coming to in the future for, for Elrond. But uh, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about the ERD coin or token, uh, the current utilities, the future utilities, how you see the token evolving in the future, that would be absolutely great. Sure. So the most important thing is that from the ERD, uh, we are moving to eGold. eGold um, is this new standard that we're trying to uh, position. So things are extremely simple, again, to convey um, because... Think about it for a second. If you need to explain to uh, your grandmother uh, or I need to explain to my parents what, what Bitcoin is, even the name um, cries out complexity, right? But if you start with something like e-gold, uh, things are already super simple because you can start and say something like um, you had books and then you had e-books. You had mail and then you had email. You had gold and now you have e-gold. This is the currency that will become a digital reserve for the entire Elrond ecosystem. This will power the entire ecosystem. But then um, we're, of course, having staking on top of it. We're having a swap that is um, essentially being done at the beginning of September uh, through Binance and then several exchanges and partners that we have um, uh, we uh, partner with and we're already working with. And um, based on this, we're also going to release a lot of um, collaborations and partnerships that will allow people in the Elrond ecosystem to um, not only stake as they do right now, but also have um, lending, have exchange possibility in different ways, and then have access to some of the most advanced DeFi um, options in the space. So we're very, very excited about this move. Um, this is a bit of a friction at the point where you're making the change, but we are proactively trying to manage this by clarifying things simplifying things and um, we're very confident that once you um, have one month pass um, you'll look back and basically no one will even remember the the pass everything they'll see is how simple things are how easy it is to communicate convey and this is this is the key value um, that we want to build Elrond around and um, yeah, we are happy with the progress that we're making. That sounds absolutely great. And thank you, Benjamin, for always mentioning to make it easy for grandmas, right? Grandma Susie needs something easy. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. And one last question I'd love to ask you. Is since you guys, I guess you'd be considering yourself as a third generation blockchain, right? As the latest generation of blockchains. You know, as of today, obviously life is not perfect, right? There are always challenges ahead of us, you know, which is great, right? That's what makes it fun. Um, you know, what do you see as the kryptonite of third generation blockchains? What is the current problem that you really want to solve to reach that, you know, uh, that whole ecosystem for the masses and not have, you know, only geeks, like you said, have a very closed uh, group? 
I believe there are two very, very important um, problems that are necessary to be solved in order for us to reach the 1 billion people that we're targeting. First of all, um, there's a clear necessity to move to an internet scale blockchain. And this is what we have with Elrond. Unless you can process transactions at super high speed with very high bandwidth and very low cost, you cannot build anything on the blockchain. Um, everything remains a toy. But having this solved is not sufficient, right? You need to move one step further and what we will um what what will become obvious during the next weeks and months, especially with Mayar coming out, is how large the elephant in the room is when it comes to complexity and user experience. So by far, um, I believe the whole discussion will shift immediately after people realize that we've solved the technical problems. The whole discussion will shift around user experience because this is the main important limitation that has kept the blockchain space to 50 million people after so many years. If you can reduce this complexity and make things super simple and obvious, at that point we'll be able to um, 10x the number of people or 20x the number of people so that the whole space um, will have a, a very, very different uh, growth factor uh, a very, very different um, quantity of, of people and very interesting and different tools that come out of so many contributions from the people who join. Nice. I love it. I love it, Benjamin. I mean, fantastic answers. And we're so happy to have people like you, builders and problem solvers that got you into the space and is still pushing you to continue to move the space forward and, and reach the masses. And all of these chains, like you said, even DeFi, they need that type of blockchain of scale or internet of scale to actually achieve all these uh, accomplishments. Uh, Benjamin, thank you so much for your time today. If we want to follow you, where are you the most active these days? Obviously, we'll put uh, a link for the Elrond website in the description box below, guys. So don't forget to check that. But where are you the most active these days? I see you on Twitter quite often. Yes, Twitter, I think, would be the, the best place to look. Um, definitely check Elrond.com. Definitely check Meyer.com. Things are moving really fast um, in our community, so we welcome any feedback and um, yeah, very curious to, to hear um, how you guys think about these things. Definitely, we'll check into that, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment below if you have any questions for Benjamin. He's a very busy man, but we'll try to get back to you with an answer. And join us every Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock BST. Thanks so much and see you next week, guys. Thank you, thank you.